This is the Retirement Lifestyle Advocates radio program. I'm your host, Dennis Tubergen. Glad you decided to listen in today. Hey, joining me on today's program in segments two and three is Mr. Rob Kirby. Uh, Rob is the founder of Kirby Analytics, a very bright guy, a very hardworking researcher. And I'm going to talk to him a bit about the work of Dr. Mark Skidmore of Michigan State University and Catherine Austin Fitz. And we're going to talk about missing government money. It's a, a very interesting conversation. I know you're going to find it fascinating. And we're going to talk about uh, and, and get Rob's take on how this affects markets. We are making available an additional resource during the month of October, we are doing a virtual revenue sourcing class. The class was formally taught at a university. It's now being offered virtually. You need only a computer with an internet connection to participate. The class will show you over three nights, beginning on three consecutive Tuesday nights in October, how to use a simple four-step process designed especially for today's economy to help you maximize your benefits from Social Security, to help you divorce yourself from the IRS and your IRA and 401k accounts, and use the revenue sourcing process to move toward achieving your dreams of a comfortable, stress-free retirement. If you would like to get more information on the course or register to attend, the cost to attend is just $49. That covers the cost of the workbook and the handouts. All you need to do is go to revenuesourcingcourse.com, revenuesourcingcourse.com, and uh, you can register to attend, as I said, or get more information there. There is a lot going on around the world, economically speaking, financially speaking, and as far as currencies are concerned. Maybe some of you saw this past week that the country of El Salvador this past week became the first country to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. That means businesses in El Salvador now need to accept payment for goods and services in Bitcoin as well as in the U.S. dollar. And the U.S. dollar has been El Salvador's official currency since 2001. Now, El Salvador has an extremely young president who is very popular with the public in El Salvador, but other world leaders, world leaders who have an interest in maintaining fiat currencies, have accused this young president of eroding democracy. We'll see how this plays out. Also making news this past week, municipalities and cities are borrowing money at a record pace to shore up their pension plans. Now, when a city goes out and issues bonds or borrows money from investors to shore up pension plans, it's called a pension obligation bond. Now, I've been talking about this here on the radio program on and off for a very long time now, stating on many occasions that these artificially low interest rates that the Fed has put in place are affecting the funding of pensions. Pensions need to invest safely to protect their funds so they have funds to pay out to participants. And these low interest rates have made it very difficult for pension funds to achieve a reasonable rate of return. So now pension obligation bonds, which were issued very heavily previously and led to the bankruptcies in Detroit, in Stockton, California, and San Bernardino, California, just to name a few cities, are now coming back. Stock market bubbles seem to be attracting cities to borrow money from investors pay a low interest rate, and then invest it to try to make a higher interest rate. Now, if you're not familiar with how a pension obligation bond works, a city or a municipality or a county issues a bond for all or a portion of its missed pension payments. They then dump the proceeds into its pension coffers to be invested. 
If the returns on pension investments are higher than the bond rate, the additional investment income will translate into lower pension contributions for the city or the county. Now, the higher the market goes, the less likely it is, in my view, that this maneuver will actually work. The stock market is, at this point, extremely overvalued. And although it could go higher, it seems that these pension funds are taking on much more risk than they might stand to gain in a reward. Now, get this. State and local governments had, have borrowed about $10 billion for pension funding this year through the end of August. That's more than in any of the previous 15 full calendar years, according to Bloomberg. The number of individual municipalities borrowing to shore up pensions went up to 72 from a 15-year average of 25. That's almost triple. Now, among those municipalities considering pension obligation borrowing is Norwich, Connecticut. Norwich has a population of about 40,000 people, and its yearly payment toward its old pension debts has now risen to a $11 million in 2022. That's four times the annual retirement contribution for current workers, and it's 8% of the city's budget. The city will vote in November on whether to sell $145 million in 25-year bonds to cover the pensions of retired police officers, firefighters, city workers, and school employees. This is a very risky maneuver that will ultimately, in my view, fail and create an even bigger problem for these municipalities to deal with. There is a lot going on in the world today, and there's a lot going on that may threaten your dreams of a comfortable, stress-free retirement. To that end, as I mentioned at the beginning of this segment, we are offering an additional resource on three consecutive Tuesday nights in October, beginning on the 5th and concluding on the 19th. We are offering a revenue sourcing virtual class. This class was formerly taught at a university. It's now being offered virtually. You need only a computer with an internet connection to participate. The cost for the class is just $49. That covers the cost of the workbook and the handouts. We would love to have you participate and learn the four-step revenue sourcing process. It's simple. It's easy to duplicate. And at the conclusion of the class, you will have your own customized revenue sourcing plan. If you'd like to learn more or you'd like to register for the class, all you need to do is visit the website www.revenuesourcingcourse.com. That's revenuesourcingcourse.com. You can make your $49 payment there and register, or there will be a phone number there to call to make your registration. I will return after these words with my special guest this week, Mr. Rob Kirby of Kirby Analytics. You are listening to RLA Radio. I'm your host, Dennis Tuberg, and I have the pleasure today of chatting with a very bright guy, Mr. Rob Kirby. Um, Rob's website is kirbyanalytics.com. For those of you that have been longtime listeners to the program, you'll recognize Rob as a returning guest from about a year ago. Rob, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure to catch up with you again, Dennis. So, Rob, uh, we were chatting a bit, and... Uh, you know, we had some developments uh, in the news today that the country of El Salvador has now adopted Bitcoin as legal tender, and yet Bitcoin prices dropped fairly significantly. What do you read into that? Yeah, uh, well, uh, when you say they dropped, the price of the Bitcoin dropped fairly significantly. I'm going to suggest to anybody who wants to pay attention that uh, the announcement of El Salvador, even though they're not really a major, major league uh, economic powerhouse in the global community, the very fact that they've adopted cryptocurrency as legal tender officially is probably one of the single most bullish things for cryptocurrencies that has occurred in the last three years. And isn't it incredible what happens 
with that being said, because prior to that announcement this morning, uh, Bitcoin was trading over 52,000. And within minutes of the announcement, the official announcement, uh, Bitcoin had dropped to a $46,000 handle. It's currently above 47 as we're taping right now. But let's just say it dropped $5,000 on an extremely bullish uh, announcement for cryptos. So what's all that about? And I have some thought to offer as to what, what has transpired this morning. Um, the ambush that we saw on Bitcoin this morning is extremely reminiscent to me, at least, as a longtime metals follower. Um, the ambushing, the counterintuitive ambushings that we've seen on a very regular basis in the metals market. When, when news occurs that intuitively would lead someone to think that metals prices should rally and go higher, so often the exact opposite to what you would intuitively expect occurs in the metals. And they're socked and they're beaten, like beaten with a stick very badly. And doing the kind of research that I've done over the years, uh, I'm uh, very much a subscriber and a follower of the work of GATA, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee. And whether people want to accept it or not, the metals are extremely uh, suppressed. Uh, there, there's interference on the part of officialdom uh, in the metals markets on a daily on a, on a daily basis. I would argue, um, and we see these <coughs> excuse me these dramatic counterintuitive moves in metals prices uh, on, on a very regular basis. Well. What, what has occurred today in, in Bitcoin, as I said, it reminds, it reminds me of these counterintuitive uh, flash crashes we often associate with the metals markets. And, and, and what I'd like to address is where, where officialdom gets the mustard to, <coughs> to make these counterintuitive moves like this $5,000 drop in seconds in Bitcoin, how they make it happen. Well, I follow very closely the work of Catherine Austin Fitz and Dr. Mark Skidmore. Um, most people listening, I'm sure, would be familiar with the name Catherine Austin Fitz. She was a former S Assistant Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, under Jack Kemp in Bush 1 administration. <clears throat> and Dr. Mark Skidmore occupies a very prestigious uh, chair in economics as a PhD uh, economist at Michigan State University with a, uh, uh, with a, with a PhD student uh, research team underneath him. And he is, his expertise is public finance, and he, he and Catherine have done work their initial work was covering the period 1998 to 2015, uh, where they identified U.S. government books, specifically the agencies of HUD, Housing and Urban Development, and the Department of Defense. And they found that there was $15 trillion worth of accounting adjustments in the U.S. government's books over that 17-year period <clears throat> that there was no explanation for where the money went. So that was a story about 21 trillion missing money. <clears throat> Since then, Dr. Skidmore has done updated work, and I believe the last year he did work for uh, was the year of 2019, where he examined the books of the Social Security Trust uh, edifice. And in this research, Dr. Skidmore basically identified that there was $400 billion in investable assets under the moniker Social Security Trust Administration. So $400 billion in retirement assets for the last year that Dr. Skidmore did work, 2019, uh, the turnover on that $400 billion was $44 trillion plus. On Unbelievable. Billion in assets, and he he feels that the internal machinations 
that he was able to uh, to to identify. Uh, I mean, look, understand he's using government data, and he believes that there are many tens of trillions of uh, recorded transactions that are either that are either bogus or that there's there's just there's just no rhyme or reason to them. Um, to me, to me, Dennis, it it amounts to a huge neon sign. Like think think about the biggest neon sign you've ever seen in your in your life, and this one says fraud, with an arrow pointing to the Social Security Trust Administration edifice. Okay, so what this amounts to, as far as I'm concerned, uh, there there is money that is being fraudulently created. And it's being stored in Heidi, what I call Heidi holes, like the exchange, uh, the ESF Exchange Stabilization Fund, and the ESF is an adjunct of the U.S. Treasury that is beyond oversight by by anyone. It's operated at the discretion of the uh, Secretary uh, of the Treasury and uh, let's just say the executive branch of the government, and I believe in 2006, it was the simpleton George W. Bush who who basically extended some of these privileges to the, to the uh, uh, deep state or the, uh, you know, the security complex in America. Uh, in 2006, uh, some of that, some of that ability was transferred to uh, the intelligence czar in America, who at the time was John Negroponte, and I mean this stuff's all recorded in the Federal Register, and you 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 can go dig it out and and read original source documentation that that ex- explains and uh, confirms what I'm what I'm saying here. By the way, uh, but the reality is they have these slush funds of money. They have these slush funds of money that I consider it, or I call it dark money because it's not acknowledged to exist. And it, it's with this dark money that these uh, counterintuitive uh, market outcomes are created. It's like most people listening to this would have heard of something called the uh, plunge protection team. Uh, the plunge protection team is a real thing, the plunge protection team has has a has an official name it's called the president's working group on financial markets and the president's working group on financial markets was formed in the aftermath of the 1987 stock market crash uh, by then president ronald reagan and what what the what the president's group on uh, president's working group on financial markets was charged with doing was ostensibly to prevent a stock market crash like one that happened in 1987, um, and that's pretty much what they've been doing now for the for the last you know since call it 1989 or 1990. So for the last 30 years, these guys have been hard at it, trying to prevent catastrophic events from occurring in financial markets. And uh, I mean, some people would say, well, it's a good thing, you know, they've been around because, you know, that's exactly what they've done. And I would, I would, uh, I would actually argue with that. In, in fact, that what they've done, what they've done by trying to prevent, or, or in their vain hopes at preventing financial catastrophes, they've probably set us up for uh, something horrific, which will come our way. In, in in short order, I do believe, because you know, making things appear as they are not in in the financial world generally ends in in tears and ends with very negative outcomes. And what what this dark money uh, that is identified by the work of uh, Dr. Skidmore and Catherine Austin Fitz, I would contend that this is the firepower that the plunge protection team uses to steady the stock market if it's if it's susceptible to a big decline 
This money is used to suppress prices on precious metals because precious metals represent a credible alternative to fiat money, which is being debased at, a, at an awesome rate. Uh, the, uh, this undocumented money also allows the U.S. government to step in and basically buy any American debt that any foreign nation wishes to sell at any time without upsetting the U.S. debt apple cart, so to speak. Um, and the other thing that, and this morning, this $5,000 drop in uh, Bitcoin tells me that what they are also doing with this dark money, uh, they're doing something I call buy high, sell low. And most of us think that the way to riches or the way to wealth is you buy low and sell high. But with digital currencies or cryptocurrencies, something quite the opposite is occurring. Because, because the central banking community globally is trying to bring in their own version of digital currency or cryptocurrency, uh, and and huge difference between like Bitcoin, Ethereum. Bitcoin and Ethereum are, are, are what, what are known as decentralized cryptocurrencies, meaning that they have a finite number that will ever be produced and will ever exist. But central bank digital currencies are to be centralized and controlled by central banks. And what they amount to is a do-over for the banks in fiat except in just digital form, because a central bank digital currency will not have hard caps on the amount that will be issued, and it will be at the discretion of any central bank as to how much of their digital currency they will ever uh, issue or, 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 or you know, make available. So this, by the way, is why these central bank digital currencies well, you know, those are dogs, in, in my view, those are dogs that will never hunt. They will never gain traction, and people will never believe them, because people intuitively and instinctively know that central banks are liars. They lie to us about how much money exists. They lie to us about, uh, about, what, about what the state of our economy is in. And the odds of them ever successfully having traction with the population at large on, on digital currencies they issue, it won't happen. Uh, that's, that's a market niche that the d decentralized uh, digital currencies, you know, and the, the two poster childs are Bitcoin and, and Ethereum for, for, these, for these decentralized uh, cryptocurrencies. Hey so, Rob, that's uh, we're we're sneaking up here in the end of a segment. I want to pick this up sure. in the next segment, but we are uh, the the clock tells us we've got to take a break here. But my guest today is Mr. Rob Kirby. His website is KirbyAnalytics.com. I'll continue my conversation with Rob when RLA Radio returns. Stay with us. This is the Retirement Lifestyle Advocates Radio Program. My name is Dennis Tuberg, and your host. I'm chatting today with Mr. Rob Kirby. His website is KirbyAnalytics.com. The website, again, is KirbyAnalytics.com. And, Rob, in the last segment, um, you, you concluded by saying that central bank digital currencies or central bank-issued digital currencies, I should say, are dogs that won't hunt. Expand on that. Yeah, Dennis. Uh, my, my rationale to make such a statement is that uh, we we have the we have the living example of what central banks are doing and have done with the fiat currencies that they control, and they they are also centralized and 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 can be issued at the discretion of you know of the issuer, and there's no reason to believe that any central bank issued digital currency wouldn't be exactly the same, and uh, these these central bank issued digital currencies just in my view, will 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 never have will never have traction, and are never going to be adopted wholeheartedly by what I consider to be smart money. And I mean, we know that the central banking community, Dennis, is involved and engaged heavily 
in the existing cryptocurrency uh, machinations. Uh, I mean, pre-interview, Dennis, you and I had a, a very brief discussion about the amount of cryptocurrency is transacting currently on a daily turnover basis. A remarkable oh, number. We should go into that. Yeah, well, like today, as, as I pointed out to you, today, the uh, latest 24-hour period has had a turnover in dollar terms of $168 billion in the cryptoverse. Well, let's just say for the last two weeks at least, and for, for, for a very long time, we've, we've had, we, we haven't had a day under $100 billion in daily turnover. And in the last couple of weeks, we've had uh, consistent days over $150 billion. And I mean, if you annualize 150 billion daily turnover, you're you're up around 52 trillion in turnover. That's 52 trillion with a T R trillion in turnover annually. That's the current run rate on crypto turnover. Well, I'm going to suggest to anybody who wants to listen that. When you have turnover in crypto of $52 trillion a year, um, we have global GDP, which we surmised is probably somewhere around $60 trillion. Uh, the question I posed to you before we got on this interview, uh, Dennis, how, how can there not be a global trade settlement occurring in crypto? when there's 52 trillion of it turning over on an annualized basis. And as I, as I uh, expressed to you before we started taping, uh, it's, it's clear to me that the cryptocurrencies are eating off the dollar's plate right now in terms of cryptocurrencies are being used de facto to settle international trade accounts. And corroborating evidence for that uh, apart from the sheer volume of cryptos that are transacting, uh, I look at I look at the countries of Venezuela and Iran, and Venezuela and Iran have been excluded through uh, you know embargoes and through sanctions. They've been excluded from using SWIFT S W I F T, which is the international settlement mechanism for dollars in trade. And uh, when you cut off major uh, natural resource producers and exporters from settling uh, their primary uh, uh, commodity they have to sell the world, namely oil, and oil, for the most part, supposedly trades in nothing but dollars in the world. Well, you've got two huge players in the dollar area, uh, sorry, in the oil uh, business that aren't allowed to use dollars. Okay. Oh, and, and and their biggest and their biggest customer who they sell all their oil to happens to be China. Oh, and and China isn't really very friendly to the dollar either. Oh, and oh, and at the same time we have we have 52 trillion dollars worth of uh, uh, cryptocurrencies settling on an annualized basis. Well, wake up, people! Crude oil is being settled in cryptocurrency in front of our noses right now. And the extent to which this is occurring, nobody's leveling with, with, with the global public at all. <clears throat> this is why, this is why the decentralized cryptocurrencies scare the establishment and why they have such, such derogatory comments and, and why they want to develop the narrative that they are too volatile and why they attack them to the tune of $5,000 on, on the back of news being released that should have been very positive for the cryptoverse. Instead, we see a $5,000 drop. And why is that? Because the central banks in the Western world have been in the market. They are in the market. They collect this stuff. They, they, they build up inventories of cryptos. And then when we get positive news that would naturally propel them higher, they back up the truck and they dump them in the market. And they and basically, it's a race to see how quickly you can sell however many billions worth that they have to sell. And they force the price down. 
But you see, that only lasts so long, and the effects of it wear off because the world has turned its back on dollars in trade settlement. And, you know, further supporting evidence to back the claim, last week on Tuesday, right after Afghanistan fell to the Taliban, and uh, we saw that was on Monday, and then on Tuesday, it was announced that Saudi Arabia had a new defense pact with Russia. And if anybody who knows anything about the petrodollar and the creation of the petrodollar, the whole the whole underpinning of the petrodollar uh, was an agreement between Henry Kissinger back in the Nixon era. Mm-hmm. with Saudi Arabia, that America would guarantee to protect Saudi Arabia militarily, and in return, Saudi Arabia would sell their oil for nothing but dollars, and uh, and they would fund, they would effectively recycle the dollars they received in exchange for oil into U.S. government debt to support the, uh, the debt machine of, of America. So... The underpinnings for the crypto or for the petrodollar, as far as I'm concerned, have now been removed. And as far as I am concerned, uh, and, and, and I think a lot of people in the world see it this way, uh, the Saudi Arabia is now completely free as free as a bird to sell their sell their oil for any currency they wish to, because they don't they don't need American protection anymore. They have Russian protection. So, Rob, when do you see this uh, price suppression of cryptos and metals? When do you see this changing? Is is this just around the corner, or can this go on for a while? Well, uh, let's put it this way: with with the with the underpinning of the petrodollar now seriously in question, with uh, uh, with Russia now b- basically being being the uh, Hired muscle for the Saudi Arabians. Um, I I think things could could actually move at a very very rapid pace now. Uh, I've heard I've heard a couple of people who I respect suggest that do- the dollar could lose reserve currency status by next March, in March of 2022. I think it could happen even quicker. I think we could be in a in a I think we could be in, a, in an absolutely different world before the end of the year. Things things are moving at a very, very, very accelerated pace right now in this regard. And with, I mean, this this uh, this announcement that Saudi Arabia has, has a new protector militarily in Russia is, cannot be underestimated, the, the, the import of this. It's, it's huge. And all I can say to you is the amounts the amounts of crypto being transacted continue to vector up at a dramatic rate. And, you know, th- let's just say this, Dennis, the unwantedness of U.S. government debt is expressing itself in the repo market. You see, a year ago, the amount of daily repo, uh, the, the, the repo market for U.S. government debt is a reflection of debt the world doesn't want. So the more the more debt US government debt the world doesn't want the the bigger the amount of repos are done on a daily basis to effectively it basically it's 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 a it's a homeless shelter for US government debt the repo <laughs> the repo market okay and if 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 the US government debt isn't isn't being being held in this homeless shelter called the repo market there's only there's only two ways that that can go away or or become less either people become willing buyers of us government debt which means that the amount of repo would go down or the fed takes that debt onto their balance sheet but you see the fed's already grown their balance sheet from three and a half trillion ish to 8.2 trillion in the past year <clears throat> and and I the Fed I think is becoming extremely concerned about taking on another trillion here or another trillion there because pretty soon 
you know, you're, you're, you're talking serious money when you're talking trillions like this. And pretty soon, you know, if you continue along this line, you can end up with something on your hands that resembles Zimbabwe. And this is something that the Fed is, believe me, it keeps them up at night. They're very concerned about this. But you know what? They are cornered, and I consider them effectively, they're, they're, be, they're acting like cornered rats. And they have no way out of the predicament they're in other than to continue to print money and to hyperinflate the currency. And that's what we are seeing occur in real time in front of our eyes. And listen, listen people, back when Germany had their Weimar uh, experience, for the longest time, Germany was creating money uh, they were creating Reichmarks at a phenomenal pace. And for the longest, longest time, it it appeared that the world had an insatiable appetite for any amount of German government debt that they issued until they broke the, you know, at some point there was the straw that broke the proverbial camel's back. And then hyperinflation ensued and it came on as all hyperinflations that I've ever studied and there there have been hundreds of hyperinflationary uh, episodes over the past two or three hundred years and all of them seem to come on or the commentary that that is transmitted about all hyperinflations to the people who experience it, it usually is like a thunderbolt coming out of a clear blue sky in that it's never expected, but they come on extremely quickly and, and they ravage the economy uh, with lightning pace. So I'm just saying, looking at what I look at, we're there. And this this is coming. This is coming home to roost. Cryptos, you know, I, I don't really view cryptos and, and precious metals any differently. To me, you see, I, I put them in a basket. I call it the anti-dollar basket. And I mean, fit, and when I talk about metals, I'm not talking about owning ownership of gold futures or silver futures or or ETFs like GLD or SLV. I think I th- I, I believe GLD SLV are are frauds. Um, and these these are instruments that were created by officialdom to deflect investment that would normally would have would have found its way into physical precious metal. Instead, they create a derivative form of metal called an ETF, and it siphons money that otherwise would have would have gone into physical metal and pushed physical metal prices higher. Rob, I'm uh, sorry to say, as fascinating as this conversation is, that I am out of time, so we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, yep. My guest today has been Mr. Rob Kirby. His website is kirbyanalytics.com. Rob, always appreciate your perspective. Thanks for coming back on the program, and I'd love to have you back down the road. Uh, look forward to doing it. We will return after these words. You are listening to RLA Radio. I'm your host, Dennis Tubergen. Thanks again to my special guest today, Mr. Rob Kirby, for joining us on today's program. Hey, if you're just tuning in, I want to make you aware of an additional resource that we're making available. It is the Virtual Revenue Sourcing class. This class used to be taught at a university, but now it will be taught virtually. It will be held three consecutive Tuesday evenings in October, the 5th, the 12th, and the 19th. And it will teach you the four-step revenue sourcing process that you can use to plan for retirement, including maximizing Social Security benefits and managing the taxes on your IRA or 401k. If you'd like to get more information or register for the class at a cost of just $49, all you need to do is visit revenuesourcingcourse.com. The website, again, is revenuesourcingcourse.com. You know, I've been talking a lot also about the prospects of stagflation. If you're not familiar with stagflation, stagflation is simply rising prices 
or inflation coupled with a contracting economy. Now, there's a lot of evidence that prices are increasing. I will give you just one. The Food and Agricultural Organization released a statement last month that said that their food price index increased 3.1% in August from July, and year over year, it's up 32.9%. Now, food price is up 33% in the last year. Probably uh, really doesn't surprise too many people who do some uh, grocery shopping, but that is a big, big number. Now, heading into fall, there are many forecasters, there are many grocers saying that this is going to get worse. This is going to cause some economic turmoil uh, among those in the lower income bracket, and particularly those who um, are in emerging market economies because they spend a much, much greater percentage of their income on food. Meanwhile, we have the economy contracting. Zero Hedge reported that while the second quarter was the best quarter for the economy in decades, in quarter three, it is now widely accepted that the wheels came off as a result of a sudden negative change. Now, you don't have to look too hard to find out why. There was a jobs report a week ago that can only be described as catastrophic. Consumer confidence is plunging. Retail sales have contracted. Uh, Expectations have been missed on the retail end for three months in a row. Government stimulus money is drying up. And as a result, economic analysts are cutting their forecasts. Morgan Stanley originally projected 6.5% growth in the third quarter. They're now saying 2.9%. Also, Goldman changed its third quarter GDP forecast for the third time in a month. Think about it. Changing your forecast three times in a month or once every 10 days on average means that things are changing in the economy very, very rapidly. Couple all this with the fact that the enhanced federal unemployment benefits have now expired. That affects over 7.5 million workers, and that will be an economic headwind moving ahead as well. Things are changing quickly and dramatically, and that means that the way you plan for retirement also has to change. To that end, as I mentioned at the outset of this segment, we are offering a virtual revenue sourcing class. This class used to be taught at a university. It will now be offered virtually. You need only a computer with an internet connection to participate. And during the class, you will learn a simple four-step process designed especially for today's economy to help you plan for retirement. The cost for the class is just $49. You can visit the website revenuesourcingcourse.com to register or get more information. Again, the website revenuesourcingcourse.com to register for the virtual revenue sourcing class or to get more information. That's all the time I have for this week's program. Hope you got something you can use. I'll be back again next week.